Welcome to the Frugalpreneur Podcast. I am your host, Sarah St. John, and my guest today is an author, speaker, entrepreneur, consultant, and live video marketing expert. Please welcome to the show, Joel Calm. Hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. It's very kind of you. Can you give us a little background on yourself and how you got into this space? Well, I've been in tech forever. I, I remember buying my first computer when I was 16 years old, and this is going to predate some of your listeners because it was 1980 when I bought that computer. It was a TRS-80 Tandy Model 1 with 4K of RAM. And the storage device was a tape cassette player, wasn't even no hard drive and no floppy drive even. So I was actually dialing into bulletin board systems before we had the internet back then at 300 baud, which means I've been in the online world for 40 years now. Now I'm really dating myself. But I built my first website back in 1995. And since that time, I've built sites, sold sites, done affiliate marketing, internet marketing, social media marketing. I've written 15 books. I've launched applications, developed software, done video, live video, speaking, podcasting, just about everything that, you know, is not illegal, immoral or fattening pretty much <laughs> under the sun. And it's been a fun ride. That's pretty funny. So yeah, you have several books about Twitter and live video. So do you self-publish those books or do you have a publisher? I've only self-published one of those 15 titles just so I could kind of see, okay, what's this like if I use Create Space on Amazon and, and do it? And of course, the quality of it turned out lower, but I've had four, three or four different publishing houses, four different publishers. I can't remember at this point point how many uh, I've had, but I've had multiple publishers. Oh, okay, cool. Well, can you tell us a little bit about live video marketing? Well, you know, when we talk about live video marketing, we're talking about reaching your audience using live video, right? And sharing your story and your what, the value you bring to the world, whether whatever your product or service might be. And, you know, when live video really became a something that was for early adopters back around 2014 there was that's when we saw periscope come out eventually acquired by twitter it's when we saw facebook live begin people who already had an audience of some kind now could reach them with video and what i discovered back then is that live video is the most social form of social media that you can possibly have there's just no better way to connect if you can't be face to face with somebody than on video in fact, you know, as we're, we're recording audio, but we see each other on this platform and it, it creates an intimacy that you don't have if it's just audio and no visuals. Yeah. And speaking of no one can see your hat, but it says bad crypto podcast. Is that your podcast? Yeah. That is, yeah, I'm the co-host of this podcast. The, the latest rabbit hole that I went down in 2017 was the cryptocurrency and blockchain world because I see how it's going to transform the world and, and going to impact all of our lives. And so I started a show with my friend Travis Wright, and we are now, it'll be three years in July 2020, and we're one of the top crypto podcast shows. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. So you think that there's still a future for cryptocurrency? Oh, not not is there still a future it is the future it, it is it blockchain and crypto is the future the dollar is going down in value regularly the federal reserve is printing trillions they're injecting billions of dollars into the economy on a regular basis and every time they they print more the value of what you have in your wallet goes down. Mm -hmm. There's no end to the supply. And so it's unfortunate, but eventually we will see a complete collapse of the dollar. And the, those days, I, I can't predict when that's going to happen, but that's the beauty of a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. There's only 21 million of them ever. That's it. They can't make more. And so you know that there's scarcity built in. Oh, interesting. I'm going to have to listen to that podcast so I can learn more about that because I don't know a whole lot about that stuff. Um, There's a lot of people that don't, by the way. Excuse me, uh, don't mean to interrupt, but let me just kind of give you a starting place for that. We actually set up a page for people who are like, all right, what the heck is he talking about? One of the reasons we started the show was because the concepts can really be over people's heads. And Travis and I have an ability to make seemingly complex subject matter easy to understand. And we do it with a lot of bad dad jokes in this. <laughs> Of humor. So we actually set up a page and I'll give you this URL, badco, B-A-D-C-O dot I-N actually spells bad coin, badco.in 
forward slash basics. If you go to that URL, it'll go start here if you're a total newbie to this. And we'll begin to explain to you what Bitcoin is, why it's important, and ready or not, here it comes. <laughs> That's cool. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. So as far as the live video, I was actually looking today at StreamYard and Restream because I'm starting to think about doing live video because I hear that it gets a lot more exposure, at least on Facebook and whatnot. But I've been kind of overwhelmed because I'm like, well, I don't want to go on Facebook live and it only go there. Like if I'm going to bother with it, I want it to go everywhere at once. What is your opinion on that in those platforms in particular? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, where's your audience now? Is your audience on Facebook now? Are they on Twitter now? Are they on LinkedIn? Are they on Instagram? You know, wherever your audience, your existing most engaged audience is, that's a good place to start. For me, that's Facebook. I have an audience on these others, but the most engaged audience of people that are connecting with me is on Facebook. So uh, full disclosure, I'm a brand ambassador for another live video platform called BeLive, B.Live. And it's designed to go stream to Facebook Live and to YouTube Live. I use it for Facebook and I've used it for, oh gosh, probably almost four years now. And one of the things I like about it is you can guest in up to three people and it goes, it pushes directly to Facebook, your page, your group, your personal profile, whichever one you want. And it's very elegant in terms of the lower thirds that it has. You could put in your titles and it does nice graphics, nice, you know, frames for your, your videos. You could do screen sharing, but that's if you just want to go directly to Facebook or directly to YouTube. If you want to broadcast many places at once, what we've been doing is using Zoom and can in and feeding into restream.io. In fact, Travis and I, my, my partner at Bad Crypto, we did a week long virtual event just a couple of weeks ago. And we use Zoom and brought our guests in that way. And we pushed out to restream, which you can go to multiple Facebook outlets. So we're broadcasting to my personal page, to our virtual blockchain week page, to our private mastermind group. We're pushing to two different Twitter accounts. We're pushing to Twitch, to DLive, to Theta TV, to LinkedIn. And that's one of the cool things about Restream that you can do if you're, you know, using a system that can put, you know, pull the feed and then push to all those outlets. And that can be effective. The hard thing about that is when you're broadcasting many places, you can't really engage with your audience. It is purely to take a broadcasting approach. Whereas when I use something like BeLive and go directly live to Facebook, I can actually see the comments that are coming in from the page that I'm broadcasting to in my BeLive interface. And I can put them on screen with the little thumbnail of the person's picture. So it adds a uh, level of professionalism and engagement to live video. So again, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you're just trying to broadcast one to many, then Restream is a great service to do that. If you're looking to really connect with your audience, you want to hear what they have to say, you want their feedback, you want their questions, then I would just go directly to one platform and focus on what people are saying on that platform. Okay. And the Be Live, so it can only go to Facebook or, or, or YouTube, YouTube, but at YouTube, once at yeah. a time. Okay. Yeah, I, I think they're actually developing the the next step in the tech is to be able to go to multiple streams. But again, the, the greatest strength to live video is that connection. It's what makes it social media, right? We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, wherever it is, we're used to being social with people. And live video allows us to supercharge that connection so that in real time, you're getting feedback from your audience and you can address them. You could even invite them onto the stream with you to, you know, to ask a question of you or to speak with your guests. There's that immediacy and intimacy of that that you don't get when you are multi-streaming. And the advantage of using BeLive over Facebook Live or streaming directly on YouTube is that you can put up those little quote, like someone types in something and you can put it up on the screen. Yeah, you just click. You see the comments as they're coming in. When you click, it comes up with a really nice format and a thumbnail of in their name. And yeah, it just it's way more elegant. And again, BeLive is not its own platform. It is a tool designed to go to Facebook Live and YouTube specifically, but I use it for Facebook. And then on these different platforms, do they have the video then recorded that you can then use in other ways? 
Well, you know, when you go live to Facebook, your video is archived on Facebook. So all you have to do is go into that video and click the ellipsis, the triple dots, and there's always a download video link. So you can grab that, you know, anytime you want from Facebook. Same thing with YouTube. You can go and download videos from YouTube. I'm not so sure if you can save your Periscope videos. I think if you do them from your phone, they save automatically to your phone. Okay. And so I guess the reason that live video is doing better than just regular posts is because it keeps people on the platform longer. Is that why these like Facebook and whoever favor live video? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I also think, you know, Mark Zuckerberg said he was going all in on live video when Facebook Live came out. I think that the Facebook algorithm has given preference to when people go live because it does keep people on the platform longer. And more recently, they started something called a watch party. So it used to be that you could just like, comment and share on a live stream. So like somebody's live and you go, I'm going to share that to my stream. Now people on my stream can see it. But now there's another way to share and it's called Star a watch party. And a watch party can be a playlist of multiple videos, but the way people are usually using it is to start a watch party on their own video to another page or profile. And it appears that at least for a while, and maybe still, the Facebook algorithm is giving more weight to watch parties than to regular shares because it's communal. It's saying, hey, I'm watching this my friends, you get notified, come watch with me. So now we're sharing this experience. And so I recommend anytime anybody goes live that you encourage people who are watching to start a watch party by clicking the share link and start watch parties. Different ways, you know, the Facebook interface looks different depending upon what version you have on your desktop or if you're using it on your phone. Sometimes mobile actually has a button that says start watch party. Sometimes you have to click the share link and go to more and then go to watch party. It can be pretty convoluted, but that's what I would look for. Okay. And I know LinkedIn has just started doing that as well. You have to apply for it. Yeah, I finally got it. I applied for it when it first came out, what, nine months ago or so. And just two weeks ago, not even, I finally got approved. And there's, it's decent. You know, the engagement isn't as great as what I had hoped. Facebook still seems to be better for that. But if you're broadcasting purely to a business audience for business, then LinkedIn might be the best way to go. Can't hurt to apply for it. Yeah, I applied today, actually, while I was while I was looking at Restream and all that. And then you also have a book about Twitter. I have three books about Twitter. Yeah, they're they're updated editions of the same book. Twitter Power, which came out in 2009. Twitter Power 2.0, which came out in 2010. And then Twitter Power 3.0, which came out in 2014. It's the most current that I co-authored with my friend Dave Taylor. Oh, okay. Yeah, I saw that it had 3.0 and I was like, well, I guess he's, I didn't know if you had just redone them or updated them. So with Twitter, it seems like unless you tag people or do a whole bunch of hashtags, it seems like it's hard for people to stumble upon. Yeah, it can be. Um, Definitely using hashtags that are relevant is important and tagging people that are relevant to the post, you know, not just tagging people just to get their attention, but because you're saying something that, you know, is either responding directly to something they said. You know, the trick to social media in general is really no different than any other kind of marketing. It's say something so compelling that other people want to repeat what you're saying. Mm. That's really what it comes down to is if, you know, when people put their message out there, they think that what they've just said is is so brilliant and world changing. But really, the public will determine that people who are following you will determine is this something that, yeah, I want other people to know it. what they just said, what they just posted moved me, you know, intellectually, spiritually made me laugh is a good business idea, whatever it is that would make somebody go retweet or share that. And so, you know, marketing, especially viral marketing, you know, it's not something you just create The what you really want to do is whatever your business is, whatever the story is you're telling, tell a story so compelling that other people line up to retell it for you. And that is the essence of all successful marketing. Mm -hmm. And is there such a thing as too many hashtags? Well, on Twitter, definitely, because you only have 260 
characters or whatever it is, 280 characters now. So you could definitely do hashtag overkill there. Instagram, your limit is 30. I've seen people who are very successful use those every one of those every time. I think it's annoying. I'll use a few that I think are super relevant to it. But you know, I, I'm not trying to growth hack my accounts either. I'm not in a growth phase of, oh, I need more followers or I want more followers. I want people who to, to follow me because they like what I say. It's really very organic. And if what I say causes me to lose followers, I'm okay with that too, because, you know, essentially you're looking for your tribe. And if that means I've got fewer people that are more engaged, I would rather have that than a, a lot more people that are not engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a so uh, favorite social media platform? I hesitate to say favorite. I will say most often used, and, and that would be Facebook. And the reason I, I don't say favorite is because a couple reasons. One, it's incredibly broken. It can be very cumbersome and difficult to do what you're trying to do and to find stuff. And also, I don't agree in general with Silicon Valley's approach to, uh, to of, of censorship and deciding that they're not really platforms, they're publishers, and they can't seem to make up their mind, and they want to be treated like platforms, but they behave like publishers, but aren't liable for the same types of laws that would apply to other publishers. And so there's a lot of things that I, I think that the social media space is prime for disruption. There are new blockchain based social media alternatives that rather than use people, which is what Facebook, Twitter, YouTube do, they, they don't pay you. Now, yes, if you are on YouTube and you're earning ads from you know your videos, you can get paid for that, but YouTube's not paying you. Their advertisers are, but you don't get paid to watch videos. You don't get paid to post your content other places. You have no privacy. You're sharing your data with them willingly. They're reselling your data to the highest bidder. We're all for sale. We are the product on mainstream social media sites and the new blockchain based social media sites that are on the rise respect the user and they respect your privacy and they respect your data and so i'm a big fan of what's coming next the marketplace is poised for disruption and we're starting to see the foundations begin to rumble it's going to take some time before the mighty fall but you know everything changes and, and it will happen yeah, I've kind of wondered with all the stuff that's been going on with Facebook over the last few years, if they even have a decade left. I don't know. What is your opinion on social media, period? My crystal ball is broken. <laughs> uh, you know, here's the thing that uh, really makes me sad. You know, social media offered the promise of connection and free speech. And I know these are private companies and, and free speech is about speech, you know, as opposed, in, in uh, opposed to government saying what you want, the government not being able to stop you. But, you know, when you're creating a town square, you're creating a public venue for people to say what they want. And if they don't like what you say, you get removed, you get deplatformed. I've seen it happen to people I know for inconsistent reasons. You know, one person will get banned from Twitter for saying one thing, but I can go on Twitter right now and I can show you a dozen tweets of people that are saying something similar. But because they're very arbitrary with their rules, they are targeting certain groups of people. If they disagree, and it makes sense when you've got, you know, a region of the country that is very much aligned with one political party, they can say they're unbiased, but they're not. And everybody, you know, with any eyes, you know, any vision at all and half a brain in their head can see that they're incredibly biased. And that is very alienating to a large portion of the population. And so what was the question? Where is it going in the future? I don't know how long Facebook has. I know that more and more people are getting disgruntled with the way they handle things. And unfortunately, we're there because 2 billion people are there, or maybe a billion people and a billion bots. I don't know, whatever it is, the numbers are, are astronomical. And if there were a solution that would give people more freedom where they could have similar functionality without censorship, with freedom of speech, with their data being respected, their privacy being re respected, and being compensated for content that they contribute that people engage with, I think you'd see a mass exodus. And it's just it's just a matter of time before that happens. I mean, once upon a time, MySpace was the place to go. That was actually what I was going to 
bring up next is that MySpace was more popular in Facebook. And then it almost seemed like overnight almost that they just, I mean, I guess they technically didn't go away. They still exist, I believe. Yeah. Nobody goes to it. Tom took the money and ran. Good for him. (laughs) MySpace got purchased by uh, Rupert Murdoch media tycoon and tom made his money and that was it It, and then facebook came along and and decimated them i mean talk about clunky myspace being first to market isn't always the best thing there are better mousetraps that are built and so i'm aware of multiple platforms that are competing in the social space they don't have the audience yet but they're starting there's an instagram alternative that i love it's called rebuzz rebuzz.me. It's very much like Instagram. I mean, I post the same photos there that I post on Instagram, only Instagram doesn't pay me. But when I get engagement on my posts on rebuzz, or when I engage with other people's posts, I earn their buzz token. It's a native cryptocurrency that can be exchanged for real world money. And so it's a different vibe. It's like people there actually care about the the platform. And I think that that will be, you know, I don't know if it's going to be that particular application, but there will be others that will rise up that are going to pose an alternative to what the mainstream is currently using. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to that day. Yeah, I wonder if Facebook is going to go under as quickly as MySpace did, or if it would be a more gradual thing. Yeah, I mean, MySpace only had a few year run. Facebook Mm. has been around since, what, 2007? We're already in or maybe longer when they started on campuses, 2004, I think. And they're way more deeply entrenched in society and culture. There's, you know, exponentially more people on social media now than there were in the days of MySpace. So, but it doesn't take much, you know, when the Cambridge Analytica information came out, a lot of people were like, delete Facebook. You know, you have a couple moves like that, that reveal the man behind the curtain. And all it takes is one big one for there to be a mass exodus. And people just need an alternative, right? They're, we're addicted to social media. Mm-hmm. We're addicted to, you know, that hit of that that like, that comment, that share. Even if we say we're not somewhere in our psyche, we are. We want those views. Now, hopefully, you know, the healthy way to approach that is not to base whether you're happy or sad, you know, in your life on the engagement you're getting on social media. You, it can make you happy for a moment or disappointed, but if you're basing your self-worth as some of these kids are on the likes and comments and shares. If you're planning on becoming an Instagram star or a TikTok star, boy, parents, I'm not saying don't let your kids make fun TikTok videos or whatever, but hopefully you'll give them greater aspirations than to be a social media star because that is really empty stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of TikTok, now everyone's saying get on TikTok and it's like, Mm -hmm. I'm on, but I'm on because I was on when it was musically several years ago. Oh, And I did, I probably did, I don't know, half a dozen or 20 little videos that I put on musically because I love music and I love playing with the new toys. And so I did some. And so that got ported over when TikTok bought it. TikTok is Chinese owned and it is not to be trusted. I'll tell you that much. There is, you know, whether my lack of trust for Silicon Valley is one thing, but, you know, because there's probably some good people that are there, but TikTok is not to be trusted at all with your data and your privacy. And just when you're using it, just know that you are giving it to a country that does not have American best interests at heart. And they're laughing all the way to the bank with that. So, you know, use it at your own peril or whatever that means. You could think it's harmless. Maybe it is. We just don't know right now. You know, there was a time where Snapchat was popular with the kids and I discovered it. And then I kind of, me and a couple others in my peer group, you know, older people influenced others in our group and a bunch of people started using Snapchat. And I was creating really unique and entertaining stories for about six months and I got burned out on it. And I'm like, okay, that was fun. I'm done. And now I see TikTok. I'm like, oh my gosh, here it goes again. TikTok is for kids. I'm not saying that there are, you know, that not only for kids, but primarily it's for kids. And yes, there's some adults that'll succeed on it. And as more do, the kids are going to get pushed out and they're going to go look for another platform because mom and dad have ruined TikTok. (laughs) So, and that's just, you know, that's the course. That's the circle of life with these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does seem kind of like Snapchat. I never had Snapchat. I don't have TikTok because I just am not interested in those. By the way, you just answered a question that you haven't asked yet. And that question was, is should I be Uh. on 
platforms. Mm -hmm. And you're, why aren't you on those platforms? Because they don't interest you. Mm -hmm. And this is really important because there are people out there that will say, you're not on TikTok. Oh my gosh, you're, missing. you're not on Snapchat. You're not on LinkedIn. You're not on Facebook. You don't have a Facebook page. You're not doing Facebook Live. You're not doing watch parties. You're not on Twitter. You're not using Periscope. You're missing. And, and people get overwhelmed, mm -hmm. right? Because everybody else is shooting on them. You should be here. You should be there. And I tell, you know, don't let anybody should on you. You should be where you want to be. Go where your tribe is. And most of all, go where you're having the most fun. You know, once upon a time, I did Snapchat because I had fun with it. When it stopped being fun, I left because if it's not fun for me, I'm not going to create good content. It's not going to be compelling. It's not going to engage with people. Why force it? And so there's people out there that are trying to force it on social media. They're in places that they normally wouldn't be doing things that they normally wouldn't do because some, quote, expert told them this is how to succeed on social media. And that is the biggest bunch of BS. Mm -hmm. The way to succeed in social media is by being authentically you, bringing the you that nobody else can bring to whichever platform you want using whichever mode you want. If it's Facebook, that could mean you just write text. It could mean that you post pictures. It could mean that you're posting videos. It could mean that you're doing live videos. It could mean that you're creating events or maybe doing advertising because that's what you're good at. And you're driving people to, you know, you're driving traffic to products, you know, for affiliate commissions. There's so many different ways to use even that one platform. But don't try a one size fits all where, you know, people are like, well, how do I make money on Facebook? Well, here's the ebook on how to do it. Now go do this. Well, that might be a fit for you. But it also might not. And you've got to be true to yourself and know, where do I want to be? What platforms do I like being on? What's the most fun? Where do I get the most engagement? Odds are when you discover the answer to those questions, that's probably where you're going to have the most success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there seems to be two sides of the spectrum. People say, just get on one main social media platform become an expert in it, basically, and then you can move on to the next one. And then other people say you need to be everywhere. So where do you fall? And I guess just stay on the ones that you like, I guess. And yeah, the, the people who say you need to be everywhere, that's ignorance. Mm -hmm. That That is a recipe for burnout and failure. Mm -hmm. because all you'll do is overwhelm people. When you overwhelm people, you make them ineffective or, or you're teaching them to do this ridiculous hustle and grind philosophy that's been put out there, which is when I say ridiculous, also dangerous. Uh, burnout, you know, moderation is so important in our success. And if you're going all in on something and you're burning the, the candle at both ends, that sooner or later, those wicks got to meet in the middle and then you got no wax left. You, you are burnt out. And I've seen it happen again and again. And I know when it's happening with me and I back off and I don't guilt myself. You know, I'll go on a, uh, a terror of doing a bunch of YouTube videos for a couple weeks and then I won't do them for a couple months because I'm not inspired to do them. And I'm not going to build my business on a platform that can remove me at a whim. And I've seen it happen. I've seen people demonetize and the work that they've done to build followers up over the years, all of a sudden doesn't have the value it used to have because the algorithm has changed. You know, there's a, an old proverb that says, don't build on rented land. It's not your property. And because it's not your property, the landlord can kick you out or diminish your returns at any time. And so this is why I think it's always important to have your own website and build your own email list because Facebook can shut you down. YouTube has been known to kick off entire channels that have been there for years and you have no recourse, none. Your stuff is gone. And so I'm not saying don't put videos up on YouTube or, or build a social media following. I'm saying be wise and recognize that just because you're succeeding somewhere right now or building something on that platform right now, that it's going to be there forever. If there's one thing that I can be absolutely certain of after 25 years in online business is that nothing stays the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Because there's a lot of businesses out there that have a Facebook page, but they don't have a website. And that just irritates me. Well, and not only is it irritating, but incredibly challenging to get exposure, right? If you're a Facebook page, really, the only way to get exposure is to pay Facebook. 
especially if you're just starting new, you have to advertise that page. They want your money. And most people are not Facebook ad experts and they take Facebook's easy way to boost a post, which is basically like walking, getting off the plane at the Las Vegas airport and using the slot machines that are right there in the airport. Those are the worst payoff slots in Las Vegas. The odds of you winning at the airport are much worse than if you go to a strip casino. And the odds of winning at a strip casino are worse than if you go off the strip to a local neighborhood casino. Those are where the best payoffs are. And so learning how to use the Facebook ad tool is essential if you're going to be spending money on Facebook. But what they want is people getting off the plane, pulling the slot. So they put this little boost post button there, which is the least targeted, least favorable way for you to get the results you want. And that's because they want to take people's money. That's all that is. If you're going to do Facebook ads, you better know what you're doing. You better take a course. You better do trial and error, spending a little bit here, a little bit there. You better be able to use analytics and measure the results and see where your ROI is going to be. Because I guarantee you more people fail with Facebook ads than succeed. But the ones who have got it down are wildly succeeding. As far as being found on social media, aside from tagging people or doing hashtags or doing ads, are there other tricks or tips? Well, yeah, I don't know if it's tricks. Again, I'm going to go back to telling a story so compelling that other people will tell mm -hmm. it for you. Certainly, you can use you know your other channels such as this podcast, and you could tell people where to find you on social media. You can then like what would be compelling for people? Why should they visit your social media? Well, maybe just because they like you, they want to visit it, or maybe you're doing a giveaway. Go visit my social page. Follow me on Twitter at Joel Com, and you'll be entered to win. Blah 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 this one thing or another, or you want to be on my podcast, go follow me here. I've got a post on Facebook. Tell me why you'd make a good guest, right? There's a lot of different ways that you could put the bait out there in a good way to ask people to engage with you. And it starts with providing value to them. You have to give people a why. Otherwise, there's no reason for them to do it. I, okay, I'm going to go follow you just because you said follow me. Not so much. In another book that you have called the AdSense Code, is that about Google AdSense? It is. That was okay. actually, I wrote an ebook in early, early 2005, I want to say January, called What Google Never Tells You About Making Money with AdSense. And that came after cracking the code myself on how to make money with AdSense. I was making, after the dot-com bust happened in 2000, took me a few years trying different programs to, you know, and I experimented with a lot of things on my website and Google came around with AdSense in 2003. And in 2004, I started making hundreds of dollars a day with it. And by mid 2004, I was making $500 or more a day up to a thousand. And I was telling my friends how I did it. And somebody just said to me casually, you should write a book. I thought, oh, okay. So I wrote an ebook put it out there for, I think, $77. And I thought, well, this might make a few bucks, you know, over the long term, maybe over the course of it, I'll make $10,000, right? Selling this ebook. It made that much its first week. Oh, wow. And then it just got, it, it picked up steam from there. And so after third edition came out in 2006 or seven, six, I released a traditionally published book called The AdSense Code. And through fortuitous timing, messaging, and real proof that anybody can make money with Google, I uh, hit the New York Times bestseller list. And so that was super exciting. And it's dated now. Still, A lot of the principles in it remain the same, but the AdSense technology has updated and they've got a lot more tools they have than when I wrote the book. But there was, I think, six editions of the ebook with the most recent one coming out, I want to say 2014 or 15. Still available. If you go to adsense-secrets.com, I think you can get the book there. So on Google, if you're an advertiser, then you use AdWords. That means you're going to spend money with Google. Same thing with Facebook ads. That is, you're spending money on Facebook to get exposure and traffic for your website, for your product, service, your brand. AdSense was the publisher side of AdWords. So the way that that would work is if you have a website, whatever.com, Google gives you a, a chunk of code that you put on your website and it delivers ads to your site from the people who are spending money on AdWords. See, it's the other side of the same coin. And then whenever somebody visits your website and they end up clicking on one of the ads that Google put there, Google does a revenue share with you. They basically give you 70% or so, they say, of the value of what that 
advertiser has spent for that ad to show up and they take their 30%. It's kind of like the iTunes app store. You know, if you put an app in the app store and you sell it and it's a buck or 99 cents, Apple takes 30% of it and they give the publisher 70%. Mm. So uh, I made money with AdSense where I was taking advertiser money rather than spending it. As far as which one of the two is better, they both have great tools and depends upon how proficient you are in either one. I think Facebook's targeting is probably better because Facebook has more data on each of us, you know, because we tell Facebook what we like mm -hmm. all the time. So I can, you know, if, if you like uh, Adele, I could, you know, target in your, you'll say you like an Adele page and I want to target people with an Adele t-shirt. Well, I can go on Facebook and I can say, I want to target specifically people who liked Adele's page, right? To, and so now those ads show up. So Facebook gets me all the time because they, I know when I'm being targeted and I'm like, you got me again. Buy. I got to buy it. It's funny because I'll be thinking about something. I haven't said it. I haven't searched for it. I'm just thinking of it. And I'll see an ad like minutes later. I'm like, that's scary. Yeah. I'm that's, like, how? That's very scary. Now, Facebook can't listen to your mind, right? But, but they can watch your behaviors, and I do believe they are listening. Mm -hmm. I I don't care what they say. Your device is listening to you. I would be willing to bet on it. Your Amazon, I've got on my TV. I've got one. A lot of people have a regular Alexa. Play <laughs> the bad. Play the bad crypto podcast. <laughs> Sorry, I just ended your show for a lot of people uh, <laughs> because it's playing something else now. I, I think these devices, we know they're listening. They have to listen in order to listen for commands. And uh, if you tell me that just because they say they're not using that data for anything else, I say, come on, I got some uh, beachfront property for you in Kansas if you buy that. <laughs> That's funny. I can think of one specific example that happened recently. I was having back pain and I was thinking in my head, man, I'm having a lot of back and neck pain actually too. I didn't say it, didn't search for anything. And literally within less than five minutes, I'm seeing an ad saying, do you have back and neck pain? <laughs> okay. Now I don't have an answer to that. that <laughs> That's, you know, unless we're being implanted with chips or we're part of this matrix, we're in a simulation, you know, which who knows, there's certainly been, that's been theorized. I don't think that's the case, but that's exactly what somebody in a simulation would say. Yeah. Well, and that came to my mind after that. I'm like, is there a, an implant in my brain? <laughs> Am I in a movie? Is yeah. this a Netflix TV show? Is this Black Mirror? What's going on here? <laughs> I love that show. Is this real life? I tried AdSense on my website and mm -hmm. I didn't really like it because it, it felt like it was junking it up, making it look it can. It, it can. One of the things I wrote about in my book is placing your ads, your block sizes, your formats, the colors in a way that blends with your website. So it doesn't look like you got this great content here, and you know, ad vomiting all over your eyeballs. So that's what actually your ad sense is more effective when it blends better and it's a more cohesive design. So they've developed tools to facilitate that a lot more than in the beginning when we started they had these multicolor blocks that were garish and awful. And part of what I discovered was how to take their code and not use the garish blocks, but to blend it with a nice looking website so that A, it wouldn't be disruptive to people's eyeballs and B, the ads would actually draw people in and get clicks and be more effective and therefore make money. But you have to have traffic, right? If you don't have traffic to your website, then no amount of ads is going to make you money. You have to have eyeballs first. But but it's like that for anything. You know, if you want to build your email list, you have to have people coming to the site and giving a compelling reason to give them your name and email so that you can build that relationship with them and, and communicate with them going forward. So basically, I don't have AdSense on mine anymore, but on the sidebar of my blog, I have different affiliate programs, basically. Mm -hmm. What's your website? It's the thesarahstjohn.com because Sarah St. John was taken. Uh, is, is saint spelled out no just st w oh, with an h that's where yeah I, yeah there we go let's load up your website here do a little how, how are you down with a little critique oh sure yeah that'd be great. all right let's see what we got here sarah so this is nice uh, what theme are you using here on this this is wordpress i'm assuming yeah it's optimized press i think it's called the smart theme Mm -hmm. Yep. And you've got uh, nice podcast cards. I like your show cards. That's very clear what you've got. You know, you got the the pictures of people. Do you do these yourself? Yeah, in Canva. 
and you've got uh you know it looks like a teespring or a t public mm-hmm. Shop there for T-shirts, and there's your podcast kit. You got an ATR twenty one hundred, very nice. And as you can see, I'm using a Heil PR thirty here, which is I love the ATR twenty one hundred. This is like the next step up because it's about five times the cost. When you have a, a deep voice like mine; it really helps to res, you know, pull in all those dulcet tones. And then you've got Russell Brunson stuff here. Yeah, this this is nice. This is a I, I really. I don't have criticism for you. Actually, there's one thing I'd like to see, and that is your picture up at the oh, top. Oh, there's, at the top. It just, it just says Sarah St. John in little words, but you know your your brand is essential to this site because this is your podcast, pretty uh-huh. much that we're talking about here. And so I would love to see a header on here that's got you, you know, with your headphones and your microphone and smiling and engaging, mm-hmm. you know, looking at the audience. I think that that would help to connect with people the moment they come to your site is to see your beautiful smile and face. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I have a picture on the about page, but mm-hmm. it's it's old and I need one where I'm smiling because that wasn't taken for this purpose. That was long before. Well, there you go. Now you have a you have a mission. <laughs> I love all the pictures on your website. They're all so funny. All your poses. Yeah, I have a um, a photographer here in town. She's just amazing, and I've done multiple photo shoots with her. Photographeroflife.com. Her name is Ann Barhight. And if you're in Denver and need photo work done, she's incredibly reasonable and really brings out my silliness and my serious, you know, side for the photos. So we'll do a shoot where we take hundreds of photos and then I go in and find the ones that, you know, really work for me. So I definitely need to do, and I've been meaning to uh, a photo session, an updated one so that I could do like a header image, but I hadn't really thought of the idea of with the headphones and the mic and all that, that would be a good. Yeah. Just take, well, what you do is you get with a photographer. I'm sure, you know, where you are there, you're in Texas and there's plenty of photographers and say, Hey, how much for a couple hour photo shoot where you you bring changes of clothing, you bring your props and you go to a studio, you take a bunch of pictures. And I recommend this for anybody, get a bunch of shots, not just headshots, full body shots, different outfits like that really reveal your personality. Those are great for using, not just on your website for your header, but for on social media. Like I'll use those all the time. I'll create, you know, memes on them. I'll put quotes on them. I'll put, do silly things with them and I'll use them on my blog posts. I'll use them in show cards. There's just, when you've got a whole photo shoot worth of assets, you could do all kinds of fun things with it. Yeah. And I'm thinking doing photos where like I'm kind of off to the side. So there's a lot of empty space there where I can put words, objects, whatever. Yes. And point, like point above you or reveal with your hands to the left and be surprised or look up. Look, you know, hold, or a lot of people do the thing where they'll put their hands in front of them like they're holding, you know, like a card of some kind. And then you can Photoshop in whatever it is that they're holding. There's a lot of ways, you know, to, to be creative with this. And I, th- I have a feeling that you have a severely silly side. <laughs> I just have, I just have that hunch about you. You seem like you've got that, like you can be really wacky if you want to be. And I would let that totally come out. How did you pick that up? I know because I'm looking at you and I see your personality ah. type and you've got this, you've got this mischievous <laughs> look about you. Like you're a woman who knows her own mind and isn't afraid to speak it and is probably a, a lot of fun to, you know, to be at parties with, right? <laughs> <laughs> would your friends agree? Did yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> You actually remind me of my daughter a little bit. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How old is she? She's, also, she's 25. Okay. Yeah. I'm 37. People think yeah. that I'm, I look younger than I am, I guess. Which is, which is a good thing. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do too. People don't know. I, I just turned 56. Oh, really? I wouldn't have guessed that. I would say 46, maybe. That's. Yeah. And with the haircut, probably less. But uh, my <laughs> hair is so long right now. That's why I'm wearing a cap. It's like, contain it contain it <laughs> yeah everyone's hair is long these days i call it a hair explosion it's just like <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so what i was going to ask about on my blog with the stuff on the side the affiliate links come as opposed to adsense do you find that doing affiliate link is more profitable because it's maybe more targeted? There's no one size fits all. Now, AdSense is incredibly targeted. Mm. Um, the, the beautiful thing about AdSense is it's all contextual. So let's say, you know, you've got a um, an interview with a travel expert. The ads that appear on 
that page, that detail, you know, what that podcast is about, assuming you've written, you know, some paragraphs that this person so and so in the travel industry and they do this and they do that. Google picks up on those keywords and instantly sends targeted ads to the website. So one page of your site, you know, if it's about travel, is going to be totally different than the ads that'll show up, uh, you know, about a photographer mm. and you're on another site. So it's very targeted and they've had years to fine tune that algorithm. However, affiliate products can be way more profitable depending upon what kind of markup there is on it. You know, if it's an Amazon product and you're an Amazon associate, unless it's a high dollar ticket item, you're not going to make a whole lot if somebody buys a DVD based on your recommendation. But you know, if you've got a, a Teespring or a Tee Public store and you've got some unique shirts you've designed and you're telling people on your podcast, I've got this new shirt and it's got the wittiest saying on it. It says this, if this is you go there now and use this coupon code to save, you know, 10% on it. And so now you're driving people to something that is, there's a connection to you. And I think when you're selling affiliate products, that connection is essential. This is why when you, you know, advertising has worked as endorsements for so many years, you know, when somebody that you know, like, and trust recommends a product or service, you're more likely to go there than if that, you know, it just shows up out of nowhere. And so figure out for you, what does your audience want? What's the personal connection? How do I bring them into that world so that they want to engage more with me? It's all about like, know, and trust, right? The four steps to marketing anything successful, like me, know me, trust me, pay me. And pay me is always the last part. Pay me comes about when like, know, and trust have been developed and when people don't feel like they're being sold. Your resistance to making a purchase is at the lowest point when you're not, when nobody's trying to sell you, right? When they're, you're just building a relationship with them. And so if you look at the bloggers who have been successful on um, the podcasters who are successful, they put a lot of value out first. They give a lot and they build a tribe and they build raving fans based on that content, based on the relationship with the audience. So when you've got that, people want to know, how do I throw money at you for more of what you've got? Uh, I appreciate that. I feel like I'm getting like a one-on-one -on -one consultation type of thing. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, you know, if... If I don't have something to share after 25 years of doing this, then I'm a really bad interview. Well, I appreciate your time today. You've answered a lot of questions. Was there anything in particular that you wanted to go over that we haven't? I just let people know that my most recent book is called The Fun Formula. And it's how curiosity, risk-taking, and serendipity can transform your business. It's my 15th book. It's the most personal of my books and probably the one that's most evergreen because it applies. I think what we talk about in that book is relevant to everybody. And it's about having more of what you want in life and in business by being authentically you. And it's available everywhere that you can buy books. Yeah, I have that one and a lot of your others in my Amazon cart, like, you know, the save to later, because I, yeah. I have like 150 books. In my I totally understand. Well, you know, so here's what I would love. I would love if you implement any of what we talked about today. Personally, I'd love to hear from you. And, and if any of your listeners implement and make sure they write you as well, and you could pass on the word. Um, and, and anybody can find me at joelcom.com and on social media. I'm verified on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Joel Com, J O E L C O M M. So I'm easy to find. Yeah, and that is Joel J O E L Com C O M M. I bet that's fun to say all the time. Joel Com dot com. <laughs> Well, I get it all the time and people, you know, for years, people asked if it was my real name and it is. And it's just proof to me that God has a great sense of humor, you know, <laughs> that I end up in the internet business with the name Com. Yeah. <laughs> Or was com.com already taken? C O M M. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. But I do own, I do own com.us, and that's what I use for my URL shortener for all oh. my podcasts. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, like, my most recent episode would be com.us forward slash. 59, I think, something like that. And, and speaking of which, I will have show notes at thesarahstjohn.com forward slash Joel Com. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. 